2013, I was busy in New York City, affiliated with CUNY, Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I translated all of them in meter and rhyme. Now I'm finishing the last touches on the uh, huge big uh, proofs I, I received and corrected and sent back a few days ago, and the book will uh, appear, I hope, in about two weeks, together with scholarly apparatus, notes, bibliography, etc. The book also has the English originals uh, and Turkish translations on facing pages. It will come to about 450 lines because that's in celebration of the 450th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. And uh, with that publication, everything by Shakespeare, every single line, will have been translated into Turkish. How many other languages can make a similar claim? Turkish can. I'm proud of it. We should all be proud of that. The first Shakespeare play in Turkish was Othello, not a translation, but a version of the libretto of an Othello opera in Italian that came out in 1876. The first Othello performance in English presented in Istanbul featured the renowned African-American actor Ira Aldrich. He read his lines in English, of course, but the rest of the cast in French. There were funny things in uh, productions of Othello. Vasily Zobo, the very famous comedian at the Istanbul City Theater, remembers that Desdemona did the Chiftetelli in one production. <laughs> And Othello was Göbek Hatyordu. <laughs> Another oddity came in the 1970s when the prominent Turkish director, Tunç Alman, who later served for five years as the artistic director of the Milwaukee Repertory Theater and staged two plays on Broadway as well, used two Iagos in his Othello production followed by the translations of The Merchant of Venice in 1884 and The Comedy of Errors in 1887 by Hassan Suru, who did his translations directly from English. Also in 1884, Mihram Boyajian published three chapbooks of Charles and Mary Lamb's stories of Romeo and Juliet, The Comedy of Errors, and Two Gentlemen of Verona. 1884 also saw the first sonnet translation, Sonnet 132, done in prose by Husno Osman of Salonika. In 1888, Mehmet Nadir, a mathematician and educator, published his prose translations of 41 sonnets and small sections of Venus Anadronis, The Rape of Lucrez, and The Lover's Complaint, all in prose and only parts of those long poems. It sounds anomalous that most of the Shakespeare translations into Turkish prior to the 1940s were done not from the English originals, but from other languages, principally from French. As Ottoman power was waning, some sultans developed a passion for Shakespeare. Sultan Abdurrahmit II, who ruled about 34 years and earned fame as a despot, was a theater buff with an intense interest in Shakespeare's tragedies and comedies. It was rumored in the late 19th century that when The Merchant of Venice was presented at the special exclusive palace theater in Istanbul and Shylock began to sharpen his knife to take his revenge, the Sultan became apprehensive, actually so scared that he ran out screaming and caused the play to come to an abrupt end. The Sultan later reportedly said, abandon such frightening scenes, instead present performances that will make us laugh. Abdulhamid knew some Italian. The Italian Shakespearean actor Ernesto Rossi was in Istanbul in 1889. He hoped to do Macbeth, Hamlet, and King Lear, but the censors did not permit that. He did obtain permission to do an abridged version of Othello. Sultan Abdulhamid watched a performance at the Palace Theater with considerable excitement. Rossi mentions in his memoirs that the Sultan had tears in his eyes in Act 5 when Desdemona is killed and Othello commits suicide. More than a century ago, a foremost Turkish intellectual, Dr. Abdullah Cevdet, asserted Shakespeare is the second greatest creator after God Almighty. 
Globe was the name of Shakespeare's theater significantly because Shakespeare created the world on the stage. And there is global respect and fondness for Shakespeare. But perhaps that fondness is no greater than what we uh, feel for Shakespeare in this country. More, more than a century ago, uh, we had confirmed that Shakespeare is a great cultural figure for us. But Shakespeare had detractors as well. Remember, Voltaire dubbed him barbaric once and added, his works I, are like a garbage dump. To find one grain, you have to dig, keep, keep digging into it. In the Turkish experience, though, Shakespeare has grown in respect and admiration since the earliest productions in the 1840s. The first performances took place in 1842 in Istanbul's Concordia Theater, but not in the Turkish language. 1885 saw the first printed Turkish translation, The Merchant of Venice. Shakespeare's major tragedies were staged by the enterprising Armenian director, Gülü Agop, another Armenian theatrical personality of that time, Bedros Tatamyan, gained renown as Hamlet. He was so conscientious that to gain insights into Hamlet, he went from Istanbul to Elsinore. To study Othello, he traveled to Venice and Cyprus. To learn about Romeo, he went to Verona. Shakespeare made his debut in the Ottoman capital, Istanbul, in the 1840s, late compared with Germany, Italy, and France, but early compared with China and Japan. Armenians and Greeks of the Ottoman state, as well as traveling Italian troops, were the pioneers of productions in their own languages. Some Armenian priests took a special interest in Shakespeare. In the mid-19th century, they wrote and presented plays in the Shakespearean vein relating to the early Armenian history, people such as Minasyan, Hekimyan, Terzian, Baronyan. Hekimyan stated that he read and was influ influenced by Shakespeare. Terzian's historical play, Santut, bears similarities to King Lear. A play by Baronyan shows the influences of Othello. Turkey's first woman, Hamlet, was also an Armenian, Miss Siranush Nikosyan. It's very fashionable these days to mention our Armenian cultural figures. Decades later, two Muslim actresses appeared in the role, role of Hamlet. Once in the late 19th century production of Macbeth, a funny thing happened. The Armenian actor Gülü Agop was in the role of Macbeth. In one scene, he got carried away and took a few steps upstage. The musicians thought he wanted to do a musical number and started to play a vibrant polka. <laughs> Macbeth is uh, running for funny for. Uh, uh, funny incidents, believe it or not, that great cowboy, some of you might remember him, John Wayne, was uh, once appearing as Macbeth for some reason. Why, nobody knows, but he took a fancy to Macbeth and wanted to do it on the stage. From the moment he stepped on the stage, the audience kept giggling. A while later, he couldn't stand it any anymore. He walked upstage, shrugged his shoulders, and blurted out, hell, I didn't write this crap. <laughs> Richard Burton, too, did Macbeth. For the battle scenes, he wore an armor. He had to pee at one point. He couldn't hold it and passed water into the armor. The cast and the entire audience heard the noise of running water, and everyone broke into laughter. There is a hilarious episode from a Macbeth production in Rumeli, Istanbul. In 1962, there was a major production in the open-air rotunda of the mid-15th century fortress, fortress Rumeli, overlooking the Bosphorus. The site, as you know, is majestic, and the space used for the performance quite expansive. The director, understandably, wanted scores, hundreds of extras, especially for the battle scenes. But where were they going to find so many extras? Somebody had a bright idea. Why not the nearby 66th Battalion? They managed to obtain the approval of the military authorities. 400 soldiers came to the fortress the evening of the premiere. The director said to the major, 
their commanding officer, will give your men sackcloth costumes and wooden shields and swords. They'll be lined up up there, waiting to run down the slopes when the time comes. I'll give you a flying cue, he said. You'll command them to run down and confront each other at the rotunda below. They'll engage in mock battle, but please tell them to run down vigorously and fight dynamically. The commanding officer told his men about all this. Late in the evening, the darkness descends, Macbeth starts, Turkish soldiers are all lined up, Act 5, Scotland, Macbeth, men, and Macduff's soldiers will fight. The director sends his flying cue to the ma major, and the major gives his order, all right, men, do your best, run down there and fight. 400 eager Turkish soldiers started running down the slopes with their traditional Turkish Islamic battle cry, Allah, 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 Allah. <laughs> that way our city theater Turkicized Shakespeare. That was our great contribution to the lore and love of Shakespeare. They say Hamlet is in the heart of every actor. By the same token, Shakespeare is in every Turk's heart. I have tried to express this fact in a doggerel of my own. The bard is the playwright for Turks of all ages. In Turkey, all the worlds are staged on all stages. Our lullabies are from the folio pages. Desdemona's willow song, Macbeth's rampages, mesmerize our babes in the woods and our sages. To Corneille, Racine, no plays, we might say niet, but we love and mourn Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> as soon as Richard III's evil starts to lurk, our emotions stir, our eyes pop out, our ears perk. With our countless full-dress productions of Hamlet, we have a princely boom or a royal boomlet. He fought against Turks, but we adore Othello. He lets out a bellow, and our braves turn yellow. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth is Liz Taylor to some Turks, yet Shakespeare's scholarship is one of our great quirks. To us, the music from the spheres is from Twelfth Night. We eat the stuff dreams are made on, Turkish delight. <laughs> People claim Turks are macho, but Lady Macbeth scares patriotic, patriarchal Turks to death. It belongs to Turks, that sceptered isle of John Bull. Stratford-on-Avon is as dear to us as Istanbul. We are involved. Lear can blame us. Richard can maim us. Iago can defame us. The shrew can tame us. Shakespeare, like Atatürk, condemned those who make spears they both sang loving praises of those who break spears. Our nation is Atatürk's, but also Shakespeare's. In the Turkish experience, Shakespeare has loomed large in the Ottoman imperial city of Istanbul, as well as in the metropolitan areas and rural villages of modern Turkey. Last year, in the New Yorker magazine, the talented young Turkish-American writer Elif Batuman told the fascinating story of uneducated village women in Adana, southern Turkey, doing Shakespeare to assert their identity in defiance of male chauvinism. So Shakespeare also serves as the foremost propagator and hero of Turkish feminism. Turks love the bard. Is this a mutual feeling? Does Shakespeare hold good thoughts or at least neutral feelings about us Turks? Or is the Turkish love for Shakespeare unrequited? Well, we think he is great, but he is an ingrate. He makes about 33 references to us Turks. Not one is complimentary. Sometimes he uses dreadfully disparaging adjectives. Lustful, well, maybe that's not too bad. <laughs> but barbarous, infidel, cruel, malignant, Othello boasts, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. Iago, too, scandalizes us. Nay, it is true, or else I am a Turk. Before he becomes King Richard III, Duke of Gloucester says, What, think you we are Turks or infidels? We love Shakespeare, although he felt no love for us. <laughs> Sometimes he characterized us in terms of cruelty. In all's well that ends well, 
Lafe puts this curse on us Turks. If they were sons of mine, I'd have them ripped, or I would send them to the Turks to make eunuchs of. That's scary, isn't it? In King Henry IV, Prince Henry, who is about to become King Henry V, defames the Ottoman Sultan Murat, who upon his accession in 1574 executed his five brothers. Henry praises the smoothness of accession at the English court as if nothing nasty ever occurred there. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. Not Amarath, and Amarath succeeds, but Harry, Harry. Perhaps our only consolation is that the bard has many of his characters say nasty things about other nations and ethnic groups as well. In Ottoman productions, they used to expunge the negative references to Turks. They went beyond that. Sometimes the Merchant of Venice was censored on the grounds that it might offend the feelings of our Jewish minority. In Henry VI, John Le Pocel denigrates the imperial style of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent in his communique to Francois, King of France, which stands as one of the best put-downs ever in the history of international relations. This is the way Suleiman the Magnificent addressed Francois, King of France. I, who am the Sultan of Sultans, the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the dispenser of crowns to the monarchs on the face of the earth, shadow of God on earth, 